Okay. Um, I'm here with Hannah Olson, the director of Baby God. This is her directorial debut. Um, I'm very excited to be here to talk with Hannah about her film. I, I'm an old friend of Hannah's and I have watched this film come to life. So um, I'm going to ask you a few questions now, Hannah, about your role as a filmmaker here. Thank you so much for hosting this Q&A. Um, we really appreciate it. So I wanted to start just by asking um, an early or easy question, which is that I know that you were working on Finding Your Roots before you started this film. And I wondered what hooked you? How did you know that this was going to be your debut as a director? I, um, I worked on Finding Your Roots for, for many years and I, um, I was always kind of poking around for other stories and, and looking into other things. I don't think I thought, oh, you know, I, I, I want to direct a film and I'm looking for my story. Maybe I did. I was always looking for stories. You were. And I was. And um, this was like the, the third film that I tried to make. And I was talking one day with C.C. Moore, who's the genetic genealogist on the show, and she is a really fascinating character who's kind of um, pioneered this like totally bizarre and poten like potentially explosive field of genetic genealogy, which, um, and so she was fascinating to talk to because she was on the precipice of all of these new stories. And what makes genetic genealogy so interesting is like all of a sudden there are these DNA databases with the genetic information of millions and millions of people. We've never had that before. And being able to attach it to names. Anyway, this is a very long way to say it. I was talking to Cece about her work and she mentioned that there was a doctor who had secretly inseminated his patients with his own sperm. And this was like three years ago, four years ago. And I kind of remembered that and, and plugged it away and then went back to work and worked on other things for you know six, eight months. And then one day I was like, who was that doctor? Like, I wonder who that guy was. So I started Googling and realized that it wasn't just one, it was like 22 doctors who had done this. I started, I remember I kept writing down all of the names and being shocked at how many there were. And so I started to realize that this was a pattern and maybe something that was worth investigating. Um, and it, it was in that moment when I realized how prolific this was that I knew that there was a story here that I, that I really wanted to do. Yeah, it sounds like you were also attracted, it, it, from what I'm hearing, to this kind of vacuum of an ethical discourse around it. Like, how do we even make well, it? Yeah. Because I think that when you're attracted to a story, I know that, you know, filmmakers often think about it, or journalists as well, like when you're writing an application, like a grant application, it's like, why are you the person to make this film? And I, I think sometimes you can kind of make up an answer to that, and sometimes it feels really natural. And in this case, I really thought no one knows about this, and no one seems to be putting it together that there are so many doctors who have done this. Um, and so I, I felt compelled to, to do the story. Um. One of the things I love so much about this story are just the characters and the people you found to tell it. And I just wondered if you could talk us through how you cast it for this film. How did you go out looking for not only the kids, but the doctors who would be able to do the heavy work of carrying the story through? Yeah, it's a tricky story in some ways. Well, first, when I, when I found that there were all of these doctors, I then kind of went about trying to figure out which one to focus on in the film because I was, I think I'm generally more attracted to character driven pieces or um, films that have a small enough, um, where, the focus, where the focus is small enough to get at the emotions of what someone's going through or when you can, when you can connect to a character. And I think that's harder in survey films with hundreds, potentially thousands of characters in this case. Um, and a lot, some of the doctors were alive and this particular doctor had passed away uh, in 2006. And at first I thought, oh, like, is that, should I not do a doctor who's passed away? We should be able to talk to him. 
but later, um, I think that that became something that attracted me to the story because there was this kind of vacuum or this mystery around him. Mm -hmm. And it was really important to me that the film not focus on, on the man, on the doctor, and instead focus on the women who sought his services and, and the kids whose lives he made. Um, so, so once I decided on him, then it became this process of like, well, who can stand in for him? Or who can tell us what it was like to be a doctor in the 60s or 70s. It's a totally different world. Um, so I, I, I looked for his colleagues um, and I ended up calling like all of the, the doctors who are still alive who served at the women's hospital in Las Vegas. And I interviewed four of them and I used Dr. Sheld and Dr. Silver and I was attracted to them. I was attracted to Dr. Silver because he's an amazing character who I, who, uh, who actually really cracked me up and who, you know, as you see in the film, he's kind of, he, uh, he introduced himself to me by saying he was the only gynecologist that I would ever meet who was both a gynecologist and a casino owner. And once he said, and then he gave me a chip from his casino and I thought, you know, this, uh, you're a great character. Um, and Dr. Scheld, um, I think is also a great character. And he just had such a good memory and was so kind of very detailed in the way he talked about his experience at Women's Hospital. He was also one of the founders, along with um, Dr. Fournier. So he kind of spanned the time, whereas Silver was there for a smaller amount of time, but I, I love the way he spoke. It seems um, they're amazing. I, I love them so much. I would just watch clips of the two of them over and over again. And at the same time, it seems like a difficult feat to kind of pair the lighthearted way in which they talk about what they did with the deep psychological consequences of what happens in the film, um, how we see these children kind of unraveling as they look into their past. And I wonder, as you were thinking about the five, six central characters, the two doctors and the three or four kids, however you see it, um, yeah, what you were looking for in the children to tell this story the way you wanted to tell it. Well, Wendy, Wendy was really natural because she, it was in the phase where I was still looking at all of these different doctors and kind of seeing where their stories were at, that Wendy emerged on some internet message board and said that she was a retired police officer and she just found this out. And she was beginning her own investigation. And so that was really natural for me because she, she had something she wanted to, to, to unearth and it, it aligned with what I was looking to discover. And I think that that, um, that question of finding someone who was also on their own journey of discovery here was important to me because this is so, um, who your father is, uh, is so kind of fundamental that you don't, I didn't want to, I didn't want to be in the business of messing with people's lives or of telling them that their father wasn't who their father was. It was important to me to find people who already knew about this and were curious. And so that, in that way, a lot of my casting was done on message boards, on Facebook, seeing who was responding to Wendy as she was putting out these, quir these um, queries and queries. And, um, Finding people who had something to say and who were curious. And I think the exception to that is Jonathan. Um, Jonathan is, you know, obviously a, a more complicated case. Um, and and he, he always knew that Dr. Fortier was his father, or he did from his late adolescence onward. And so, but he, he wasn't trying to discover more about Dr. Fortier. But as soon as I called him, 
he wanted to know more because he did not know about any of the, this whole other um, thing that was happening. And so all of a sudden he wasn't quite alone in the journey that he'd been going on for, you know, 20, 30 years. Um, so I guess, yeah, I, I, I wanted to talk to people who wanted to talk to me. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are other films and other, other stories where it's important to talk to people who don't necessarily want to talk to you. Um, this didn't feel like one of them. Yeah. And um, he, even with Jonathan, I mean, that's one of my favorite scenes in the whole film. And even if he didn't necessarily want to go do the investigative work that Wendy was doing, he was self-reflective about the moments in which he had stopped himself. And so that like lent a kind of balance to the other journeys that you were exploring too. Totally. And I think, um, I remember asking him, I asked him off camera if he wanted to meet Wendy and he would, he so wanted to meet Wendy and Wendy so wanted to meet anyone who would want to meet her. Mm -hmm. I think what you don't see and what's, is all the people who didn't want to participate, who either um, are on the message boards and have never responded to Wendy or Brent or um, Brad or Jonathan, because some, some people just get the information and then ignore it. And that's fine. I mean, in fact, that might be what I would do. Or, you know, I think it's one of those things you, you don't really know how you might respond. But I wish there had been a way to show that that exists. Yeah, I mean, in a way, Jonathan seemed like a stand-in for that idea. Um, okay. But I think, yeah, it's interesting that you bring that up because so much of the film is about the questions that these children ask themselves as their curiosity grows and even questions about whether or not they should feed that curiosity at all. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that Wendy's journey kind of, she was so gung ho at the beginning. And I think I, I believed her and I believed in this idea that she might be able to find an answer or what she was looking for. Like I, I also thought that together we could figure out who her, her biological father was. We could answer the question of why he was doing this. And I think together we realized it was perhaps unknowable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that as well. Um, because you have this protagonist, Wendy, who is herself an investigator. And I wonder how you saw the line between her investigation in the film and your investigation as an author of the film. Um, it was tricky. I mean, it was at the beginning, she had a lot more information than I did. So she gave me all her information and said, you know, whatever you can do with any of this, great. And, you know, I shared her on all of the Google Docs and we would be putting in information together. Um, and at some point, I think it's interesting. Actually, I think at some, at some points, both of us, each of us would get tired or um, I'd focus on a different aspect of the story and then she would do work and then I would do work. But it was in those moments where I had found something that she hadn't yet found that it became really tricky um would you show her yeah well i it's at one point i had a conversation with her where i said like wendy how, how do you want to do this like i can you know you can find out through the film or you can continue to lead the investigation or we can do this together um from the beginning i really kind of saw it as her story and so i wanted to uh, get her buy-in in that process in a, in a genuine way um, and her attitude was always like, tell me everything, show me everything, and I'll do what I can on top of that. Um, there was never a moment where she said, like, don't, don't tell me this. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes from the fact that she's really a detective. Um, and I think, frankly, like, part of being a detective is believing that an answer can be found. You know, uh, yeah. But were yeah. there ever moments when you were going with her, like through that process of collaboration, which is tricky, 
where um, she had a point of view that was different from yours that you had to negotiate? Yes. Um, and I remember having to decide against that. If they, ex when they existed, I think it would have been more on an emotional level. Like I wouldn't have responded that way or just because we're different people rather than like her feeling something. I think we both kind of very firmly felt that what the doctor did was wrong and that it was a, um, a battery and an, an assault against her mother. Um, and so, and so I, I, there were no kind of like ethical differences. There were work process differences and emotional differences, but it was important to me not to use her as like my mouthpiece or to, you know, um, I didn't want to set up scenes and say like, Wendy, why don't you say this or react to this? I just kind of would say like, okay, we're going to the library. Let's see what exists here and we'll film it mm -hmm. or, you know, okay, well, you know, she's like, oh yeah, I wanted to check the microfilms. And then we would just go and film her looking through the microfilms and those reactions and those responses were what was happening in real time. Mm -hmm. um, I found the film kind of archeological. I hadn't watched it myself for a year and then I just rewatched it in, in advance of this. And there's a sense where you kind of set, you set up a series of um, ideas and problems. And then it's like with, with each one of those, you want to dig deeper. So even with 48, you go to like the literal ruins of his former practice in Piyosh. And yeah. then with each of these children who you're following, you're digging up their family home videos and old photos. And it's almost as if the structure is built that way, like a dig of some kind. That's what I was thinking when I rewatch it today. And I wonder if you see it that way. Yeah, or that's my process. That's, um, I think I come to documentary from a researchy, because on Finding Your Roots, I worked as, as a, like as a, as a researcher and investigator, I did genealogical research. I worked on people's family histories. And I think I'm, that's also kind of like my tendency or the way that I approach the world is, is to dig. And so with all of these people, I was so genuinely curious about like what Brad was like as a child. Like I wanted to see what he was like as a child and if he actually looked like 40 year. And, um, you know, Wendy wanted to go see Pioche. I wanted to go see Pioche. I wanted to see if there were any records there. Um, because every, you know, everything was still in the building. And, and I had no idea what it was going to look like or that it would be haunted or that the equipment would still be there. We just opened the doors. And uh, I thought it was just gonna be an empty building. Mm -hmm. And so, it, so I guess both about 40 year, there was something about approaching the story of a, of a man who, who had died who made a lot of choices that I didn't know anything about his reasoning that made me really want to dig. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, and that was everything from looking into all of his legal cases to looking at everything he ever posted in the newspaper to figuring out who he lived with over the years and who he was maybe talking to about this. Um, so it, the process was different for him and for the, for the subjects who were alive. I, for them, it was like trying to figure out what their pasts were like. But there's this kind of balance in that you get to see you do both at the same time, or it feels like coherent in this way as a process. Um, uh, it was largely because of Toby Shimon, who is a wonderful editor and cut this film. Um, Oh yeah, so speaking of the documents you got, I wanted to talk to you about just the investigative work you had to do to, to get all of that. I know while I was watching you kind of work your way through this film, there were, you had learned about a series of lawsuits that were sealed or settlements that were sealed and you had to unseal those, I believe. You somehow got Dr. Fortier's journals. I just wondered if you could tell oh. us a bit about how you found some of the most compelling um, written evidence that is both the unsealing of those court cases and the journal are from Ann Dybel, who I worked with um, 
at QRI of an investigative firm. And Anne is a really, really good forensic researcher. And the journal she found um, by, do you know how it was found? It's no. crazy. Um, she found it on Twitter. Someone posted in like 19, or no, I guess Twitter wasn't around, like 10 years ago, something, like around the birth of Twitter. And saying that they had found this diary in the bus station in Las Vegas and were seeking to return it to its owner. And, and, and so we contacted him. His name was Scott. He was in Wisconsin. So I contacted him. as like, hey, I'm making a film about this guy whose journal you have. Would you send it to me? And he said, of course. And then I sent it on to his family. Unbelievable. It was wild, yes. And we petitioned to have the cases unsealed. Um, and also filed um, many FOIA requests. I mean, and I, and I guess that's another part of the film that you don't see. There, there are two families, um, the Craddocks and the Fulmers, both of their names are public, but both of their cases are private. Um, and I spoke to those kids and they were unable to talk to me because of the terms of their settlement. But I was able to see the cases and so that the information that I gleaned from the discovery of their cases informed the film, although they did not participate. Mm -hmm. And you then had to do that work through other characters. Yes. Yeah. Or through, through, because Wendy was on this journey with me through, through Wendy's investigation. Um, I wondered what your favorite moment of the film was. Hmm. I don't know. I, I liked what you said earlier about navigating the levity of, of some of the ways the doctors um, talk about medical practice and about the female body and with the kind of psychological devastation of the, the children. Um, and in some ways, as I was making this film that was in, in a lot of ways, you know, really intense psychologically to make. Because I was, I was having conversations with people that were really um, hard and intense conversations. So that I kind of clung to those moments of levity. But at the same time, I had this kind of estranged response to those moments of levity because they felt like these time capsules from this like earlier era that had actually caused the damage that was causing the heavy conversations so it's this like big cycle happening um my favorite moment of the film uh i love wendy and jonathan meeting each other in that cabin it was so real it was we drove with her for like five hours through a blizzard the flights were canceled we had to wait a day it was like snowing so hard and it felt and it was just so um the way that it ended up looking in the film felt very true to my experience of shooting it. So it, it's, it's close, it feels close to me. Um, I love Mike Wallace, who was the AE on the film, did a lot of really interesting things in the transitions, pulling archival material and connecting that with music. And whenever he would do one of those, I would kind of fall in love with it, like it was, something I could never have thought of or, you know, couldn't have imagined. Um, but I think my favorite is Dr. Silver showing the vaginas on his phone. Because it gets at, it gets at what I was trying to get at with the whole thing in a minute. Which is what? Uh, <laughs> women's bodies are not jokes. Um, you have to have consent, whether you take a photograph or inseminate someone with sperm or have sex with someone or you know remove a cyst when you're you know you have to have consent and there was something about scrolling through those photos of the vagina where it's of the vaginas um and the women's heads were cut off in the photos right you can't see their faces and so and I think that's sometimes, at least in the, with 
this particular um, time of practicing medicine in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, where I think we kind of divorced the person, especially the woman, from what was going on with her body. Um, I don't know, I'm not doing a good job of explaining it, but it, it, it kind of reduced this whole idea that allowed any of this to happen. As I was saying before, like, patient, right? Yeah, it was, it's just a, a microcosm of it. Yeah. But I think, um, again, when I was looking at these like 22 doctors, a lot of them were, you know, had done this kind of for religion, re religious reasons or to atone for abortions that they had provided or seemed kind of crazy. And Dr. Fortier didn't seem crazy at all. He just seemed very by the book and like he was doing what he was supposed to be doing at that time. So that's, you know, when you see some of the, the early gynecological texts in the film, like those were so important to me to look at, to see what he was actually, you know, thinking at that time. And that's, and in some ways that's what the, the photograph of the vaginas does for me. It, it's an attitude. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um... I also love that scene. <laughs> the, uh, I wanted to ask you too, just about uh, the reveals of the film. Like it feels to me like there are several different moments where there are pretty significant reveals. One of them is the one you're talking about right now, just the fact that throughout, even through the eighties, it was commonplace for medical students, doctors, uh, to use their own sperm to inseminate patients without necessarily telling the patient. Um, right. And there's well, some- they would, tell, they would tell the patients that they were being inseminated. They just wouldn't say with whose, with whose sperm. But it, yeah. But it wor it's, it, it's worth mentioning that the very first artificial insemination that happened in 1884 at UPenn, do you know the story? It was with a, um, a woman and her husband were experiencing infertility issues and the professor called on who he thought was the most attractive um, man in his medical school class to provide a sample and then he inseminated the woman and that was the first artificial insemination and they did not tell her that she'd even been inseminated. She was under for the procedure until several months later after she'd missed her period and was pregnant. But now, you know, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, they definitely told people that they were being inseminated. They were not, you weren't under anesthesia. Um, unless you were Mike Otis's mom. Unless you were Mike Otis's mom, Dorothy. Um, <laughs> God, I love Dorothy. Love Dorothy. Love Dorothy so much. Yeah. Um, really a wonderful, wonderful person. Um, My favorite mom. And, but I think, I think, I think, that was what they were supposed to do. I mean, we didn't know that you would ever be able to find out who your biological father was. So this was a way that was just like cleaner. Um, and so it, it makes sense. It's just interesting now looking through the, the lens of this, you know, huge genetic reveal that we've had culturally about how we then treat all of this. Yeah, and there's something super powerful in just the simplicity of Wendy's kind of closing statement about, you know, just did he think he was better than us? It's like this very, um, uh, like a simplified version of what we're watching is this paternalism of, yes, we do think we can make decisions without asking you. Right, right, um, and even, even that, like what you're saying that um, the idea that it might be better not to tell, it wasn't, that was a decision made by doctors. And yeah, like you're saying. Yeah, I mean, one of the things actually as we're talking about it now, which is interesting, is that you have Sheld and Silver as almost this chorus um, where they are this moment of levity in the film. And yet, ideologically, they're kind of the villains. And I think that's, that's life. Right? I mean, they look like people are really complicated and people make really complicated sets of choices. And I don't, you know, I think part of that is 
I mean, I, have, I had empathy for them too. Dr. Silver made me laugh at the same time that he called me honey, you know, and always thought that my male DP was the director of the film. It's, you know, it's, people make complicated choices and complicated ethical choices and there's no one who is all villain. Yeah. Um, you said earlier that when you started the film, you thought that Wendy might actually get to the bottom of something and that you'd be able to get to the bottom of it with her. Uh, and that by the end of the film, you realized that maybe there wasn't going to be a clear answer to the questions that she had. And, and that went for the questions that Jonathan had and Brad had and Mike had as well. And I wonder then, as you were concluding the film, what you wanted the audience to take away or how you kind of saw a resolution in that uh, lack of clarity. I just decided to wrap it up. <laughs> 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 no, um, it was, it felt really organic. Like how did we decide when to stop shooting and that there wasn't going to be, I mean, even as, even as we were finishing the edit, more siblings were emerging. And I kept thinking of the film as like a snapshot of this particular time in this story that existed before and will exist after. And you know, since, since I stopped filming, something like 10 more siblings have been found. I get contacted. Um, I found another child that Dr. Fortier, that briefly lived with Dr. Fortier. Um, you know, it's, but you, it's the uh, documentary is the art of the possible and what you do with the time allotted and the resources allotted to tell a particular story. And I, um, Wendy also at some point started to move on with her life in kind of a real way. Um, we found all of the documents that we were going to find. Um, and I think it was, when she stopped really desiring to, to meet more siblings. And what um, you want, how did you want to end the film? I liked, I liked that we had, that there was a reunion um, and that people could form relationships um, That something could that something could grow out of it, um, because these were real people who were going through something, you know, really real. Um, how did I want to end the film? Uh, probably with Wendy talking to the forty-year sisters, but that, that was never going to happen. Um, like that, the joke of it is that that's what could have given her all of the answers that she wanted. But of course, like, as we know from their interviews, no one has all the facts or if they, you know, or no one is, no one knows every part of one person or wants to know every part of one person. I, I, I don't know, for, for me, the idea that it became unknowable I don't know, I was talking to Justin, the DP, um, who did an amazing job with the film. Um, but talking with him and we were like, I don't know if Wendy's gonna find what she's looking for. And it was, you know, I think that happened kind of after Minnesota. Um, and I think she, this is sad, um, but I think in a lot of ways, she was looking for redemption in him uh, and, and, and didn't find it. And is that what you wanted to leave the audience with, that idea? Redemption for Dr. Fortier? No, the fact that she couldn't find it. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think I, I wanted to leave space for people to interpret the film in a way that resonated with them and what they're trying to figure out about themselves vis-a-vis -vis their parents or their who, how they are the way they are. 
I mean, I think there's, there's nothing more universal than having parents. I mean, we all deal with the fact that we are like our parents in some ways. We're like our parents in the way, particular ways that we hate. Or, you know, it's the relationship with a parent is, is you're dealing with that forever. And I thought that looking at it in this totally alien way could kind of make us think anew about that particular relationship. I, wa I wanted people to think about their relationship with their parents. Yeah, you definitely did that. And it's true. I hadn't ever thought about it that way, but you start from this really particular niche place and you end at this totally universal one, which is just deliberating almost how much to these questions about our own parents at the same time as these, we're asking these questions about our own independence and how we're different from our own parents, you know? Yeah, and I think that's why we started shooting more and more landscapes. <laughs> In no, what? but seriously, it felt like the landscapes felt like, at first the idea was kind of a stand-in for the expansiveness of what Dr. Fortier had done. Um, and I was looking for a new way to see Vegas and the desert. Um, and eventually I think the landscapes became became stand-ins for, for our own thoughts. Yeah. Like I, 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 I wanted the viewer to have space to, to, to meditate on the, these ideas. But I was trying to, to make universal. You definitely did. And yeah, more questions than answers. Always with everything. The best kind of story. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lizzie. Thank you for talking with me, Hannah.